Okay, so as you can see, the the title that we have for today, you know, it's really kind of interesting as well, right? Revealing the second coming. And one of the things we have to think about is that we are people that are not living in the time of the first coming. Right? The first coming was what? 2000 years ago, right? 2000 years ago. And that was something that the people of the Old Testament were waiting for. Right? The people of the Old Testament. So that was the promise that God gave for the people of the Old Testament that I am going to bring my Messiah and he's going to do, you know, some pretty wonderful things. Um, but there's also going to be some, some pretty difficult things that he has to speak about as well. All right. So when we look into the Old Testament, we find that there was a lot of uh, really harsh things that God needed to bestow upon his people so that they had the proper attitude. Um, but we're not the people that are living in the first coming. That was, like I said, 2000 years ago. So for 2000 years, we have been learning about the first coming. Right? We've been learning about the first coming, but that we know that that's not the end. You know, Jesus promised, as we saw in the meditation verse, it talks about in Matthew 24, uh, his disciples came to him and they asked him these three questions. They asked him, you know, when will this happen? Right? When will this, this happen? This, these things you're talking about, this destruction that you're talking about, what will be the signs of your second coming and of the end of the age? So those three questions are things that we always have in our hearts. You know, when are these things going to happen? Uh, what are the signs that we have to look for? for the, the second coming, right? The second coming, and that's what we're talking about now, and the end of the age, right? The end of the age. So what does it mean, an end of an age? I mean, that's a really interesting thing. And when we start to study the Bible, we start to realize that there are different ages of time in God's work. And you can think about, um, you can think about the time of Noah, for example, Adam and Noah. Yeah, that would be like a time, an age that God had been living with them at that time, you know, destruction comes upon them, and then a new age begins through Noah, so on and so forth. And that's something, actually, that's another topic that I'd really like to get into in the future, the different eras or different time periods within the Bible. But today, what we're talking about is, you know, really about the second coming. And what we're going to do is we're just going to be introducing some ideas, right? Introducing some ideas. And how we're going to do that is by understanding the time of the first coming. Because we're very, you know, we're very blessed. We actually have the first coming to really look into. And if you look at this verse here, or I mean this uh, this you know term right up here, revealing. Okay, the, the root word right here, this reveal, when you think of the word revelation, and this is something that people talk about a lot, right? Revelation. The root word is to reveal. And what that means is to open and show. Right? To open and show. And forgive my handwriting, I'm writing on a little scribble pad. So hopefully you can read my, my chicken scratch. But to open and show. So what does that imply? What does it imply if you are opening and showing something? It means that something was not seen before, right? And it was closed. So something that was closed and unseen is now being opened to us and revealed, right? Made to be known. Okay? And since we can do this, through the scriptures, we can see how God is revealing things, how he's giving revelation. And what we also need to know is that there are two kinds. Let me do something here. Get rid of this. Okay, there are two kinds of revelation that we're going to talk about. Okay, there's one that is in a vision. It's called vision revelation. It's when God is revealing things for the future. There's a scripture in Amos, chapter 3, verse 7. It says, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. The sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans. There we go, revelation. But how does he do it? And last week, we talked a lot about the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, and that had to do with God's plan, by right? God's purpose. But unfortunately, he can't be so upfront and, and just clear about it in the beginning because there's an enemy that he's fighting and just like in the physical world when you have you know an enemy when there's a war going on people can't just let their secrets be known by their enemy so they have that code language well it's the same thing when it comes to god and how he reveals that truth through a a, a vision allows it to be sealed at the same time right hidden that's what we mean by vision revelation so he tells things ahead of time but how he does it is by using fantastical things. You know, he can use anything. He can use the things of the heavens. He can use the things of the earth. 
right? the things of the spiritual realm or the physical realm, even people, okay? But there's also a type of revelation that is referred to as physical fulfillment. Okay? Physical fulfillment. And what this is, is when now the actual truth is made known. Right? An actual physical reality comes as a prophecy is being fulfilled. And then he wants that to be known to the people as well. So he's revealing that truth as well. So there's two kinds of revelation that we can talk about. Revelation that's given through visions. You see this through the prophecies. right? You see this through uh, all the, the gospels and you know, even the Old Testament. And of course, the book of Revelation. That was a vision that was given 2,000 years ago. But we also know that physical fulfillment, it comes. Right? Jesus was a physical fulfillment. As it says, the word became flesh, right? So he was a physical fulfillment. People could touch him. They could see him. They could hear him. And God had to reveal him to the world as well. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking into today. All right. Okay. So here, as we were talking about before, if we look into the fulfillment, right, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, then we can begin to understand, you know, really what took place in the time of the first coming. How, how did those things happen? Well, in order to know that, first you need to really study the prophecies. Right? You need to study the prophecies of the Old Testament. Because then you can see why Jesus did what he did, how he did it, you know, these types of things. Okay, so there's many different prophecies that we can look into, but, you know, for time purposes, we're just going to look at a, just a few of the interesting ones that kind of help us to understand that there's some figurative ways that God was speaking, but a very literal and very physical way that things actually were, were fulfilled. Okay? So the different revelations that were given in the Old Testament, that's what we're going to be looking at a little bit. And the thing is, is by understanding this right here, the first coming, this is going to help us to understand begin anyway, to understand what's possible in the time of the second coming, right? What's possible? Because many of the things are spoken in the same way. So if we understand how God spoke in the Old Testament, how he fulfilled those things, then we can have that beginning of understanding, right? And that's really important because the more we understand God, the more we can become close to God, the more we can follow God. And that's what Jesus says is very important. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, about talking about doing God's will, how it's very, very important. Well, Jesus also makes it very clear in a verse. Sorry, one second. John chapter 14, verse 29. Okay, in this verse, Jesus keeps saying that I tell you now before it happens. I tell you now before it happens. So if you are telling somebody something that is happening before it's actually taking place, then that would be considered as prophecy, right? To tell somebody something ahead of time, this is going to happen. So that would be prophecy. But if you keep reading the scripture, he does it for a very specific reason. Like, why do these prophecies exist? Why does God give us these prophecies? And Jesus says, I tell you now before it happens. So that way, when it does happen, Right? When it does happen, that would be fulfillment. Right? When it does happen, you will believe. That's faith. So this is how we can gain faith through the scriptures, by understanding the things that happened before, meaning God revealing that plan, just as he says in Amos 3, 7. Right? As I said before, Amos 3, verse 7. He says that the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing that plan to the servants, the prophets. So Jesus is the same. What does he say? I tell you now before it happens. So I'm going to give you promises and prophecies, right? I'm going to give you these promises and prophecies, but for a purpose. And that purpose is so that when they do happen, when the fulfillment actually comes, that's how you can gain faith. So you can believe in the prophecy and you can believe in the fulfillment, okay? To believe in the prophecy and to believe in the fulfillment. Oh, one second. Get rid of all this. All right.
Okay, so some of the prophecies that we're going to look into today that are just kind of interesting. One of them is God's prophecy about the rock. All right, what is it? Okay, there are certain prophecies in the Old Testament where God was speaking about different inanimate objects or uh, different people or different time periods. But when he's doing that, he's actually revealing something for the future. Right? He was revealing something for the future. But at the time, when they're reading these scriptures, it may have been very difficult for them to understand these things. So, for example, oops, let me erase that. Okay, so this is what that scripture actually says. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Okay, we're going to read this together. Let's go ahead and read this one together. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. Amen. 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 So again, this is in the book of Isaiah. Okay. And this is written about 700 years before Jesus. Okay. It's written during the time of the kings when they were no longer following uh, really the path of God they had betrayed. So the very beginning of the book of Isaiah talks about how God's people have betrayed him. Right? Isaiah chapter 1 talks about how they have turned their backs on God. They are no longer following the word of truth. Somebody waiting in there? Okay. They are no longer following the word of truth. And so as a result, in Isaiah 29, God talks about how he's going to seal their eyes. He's going to blind them, which means that they're not able to truly understand God's plan anymore, right? If they're blinded, if they're deaf, is as he says, then they cannot see God. They cannot hear God. They cannot understand God. So in this scripture, if you think about this, try to put yourself in their shoes. Okay? Try to put yourself in the shoes of the, the Israelites that were reading this very scripture, right? They would read the scroll of Isaiah. And as they would read it, it says, see, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I, right, meaning God, right, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested and precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. So when you're thinking about this, you got to imagine, what, what do you think they were thinking for 700 years? You know, did they think it was a literal stone that God was going to put inside of, you know, a certain place? For 700 years, they're reading, God is going to put a stone there. And then there may be some people go, you know, maybe no. Maybe not. Maybe it's something other than a stone, but they had no way to prove it, right? That would just be their, their thoughts. Maybe God is going to bring something else. And maybe even some people were spiritual enough to think, okay, maybe it's a person, right? Maybe it's a person, but they wouldn't know who. They wouldn't know when or where or how, right? None of these things. That's why it was like a mystery. God is hiding something inside of the scripture. So when you think about the characteristics of a stone, Right? What is the characteristics of a stone? I mean, it's very, very hard. Right? It can be used, as it says even here, it can be used as a foundation, something to build upon. But it could also be used as judgment. You know, at the time of the first coming, even the Old Testament, they were actually judged by being stoned to death. So there's many different characteristics of this stone. And this is some kind of a magical stone, right? A precious cornerstone that if you trust just in the stone, you won't be dismayed. There's other scriptures that say that, you know, that on this stone, there's going to be, we're going to look at a scripture later that says it has seven eyes and that it takes away the sins of the world. And so we can start to begin to understand, okay, I think, I think now we understand what this could be about, but before the time of the first coming, it would just be all guesses, right? No one would have a true understanding of what this meant, but through the fulfillment, right? And this is the important part. What did Jesus say? He said, I tell you now before it happens. So that when it does happen, you will believe. So God is telling ahead of time that he's going to bring that precious stone. And he tells us ahead of time so that when that time comes, then we can believe in that fulfillment. So this is the fulfillment, right? The fulfillment that actually is going to come during the time of the first coming. So using this very scripture, right? Using this very scripture, this is where we can come to understand how these things are being fulfilled. Okay. Let's go ahead and read this one together. This is uh, 1 Peter. Let's go ahead and read this together. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, 
and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Amen. 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 So it's only through the fulfillment that we can truly understand what God was saying, and then we can believe in that fulfillment, right? This is a faith that is what's called revealed at the time of the first coming, right? In Galatians chapter three, it talks about a faith that is being revealed. And it's not possible to believe in that fulfillment until it comes, right? You can believe that a fulfillment will come, but you can't believe in the actual fulfillment until it comes. So here you have Peter, he was a disciple of Jesus. Now, Jesus calls himself the stone in Matthew chapter 21. So I'm sure that he taught his disciples that he also was that stone, right? Luke chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus tells them all the things that were written about him in the books of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. And of course, Isaiah is one of the prophets. So he's describing all the things about himself that needed to be fulfilled. And as we see here, it says, as you come to him, the living stone, Right, not just a stone, but the living stone, because Jesus had life within himself. It says rejected by men, and this is a really sad part, you know, right? Rejected by men. God sent his own, but his own did not receive him, as it says in John chapter one. But chosen by God. Right, chosen by God. So Jesus was somebody who was actually chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones. Now, this is very interesting because now we can understand. It's not just Jesus who's a stone. We ourselves have to become that stone. We ourselves have to be something that is useful to God to be able to build his kingdom here as well. Okay? It says, and then he quotes that exact same scripture, the one that we just read in Isaiah chapter 28. You know, for scripture says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. So for 700 years, they read that scripture. And for 700 years, they could have debated on what it possibly meant. And some people could have been preaching that it was one thing and another thing and another thing. But when the fulfillment comes, all those thoughts, they go away. All of them. It doesn't matter what you thought it was yesterday. If the fulfillment comes today, that becomes the truth. And from that moment on, everyone had to learn and believe in that truth. Right? That's what fulfillment brings. It brings truth. And so again, we are people that are living for the time of the second coming. And we have many prophecies, many different scriptures that are written about the second coming. And there are many different people that preach it as this way or that way or this way. But when the truth comes, that's the faith that we need to have. Okay, so let's look at a, another one. Okay, so in this one, it's talking about a spring, right? A spring or a fountain. So again, God has these promises of a rock. God has promises of a spring. And we have to think, okay, well, what is a spring and what does it do, right? What does a fountain do? Well, if you're in the desert and you find a spring of water, I mean, that's a source of life, right? If you're really dirty, then, you know, it's a place that you can cleanse yourself. So it's a place that we can receive that water. And we know that water in itself is, is life, right? The sun, the wind, you know, the very air that we breathe, the, the water, that's what provides life for us. Okay, so let's look at the couple of scriptures from the Old Testament. Okay, let's go ahead and read both of these together. Just go ahead and read both at the, at, the, at the same time. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. And you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring and closed, a sealed fountain. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good reading. So on that day, when you hear this term, you know, when you read or see this term on that day, that's prophecy, right? On that day, at that time, right? That's a prophecy. So it says on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David, to the, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and impurity. So this is some special kind of fountain that actually heals people of their sins. Well, as a Christian, you know, what we're taught is there's only one way for your sins to be forgiven, right? But at the time, they wouldn't have known that. At the time, Zechariah, again, Zechariah is, you know, around, what, 500 years before Jesus comes, okay? Around 500 years. 
And the Song of Songs, this is written around the time of you know, King Solomon. So during this time, as they're reading this, you are a garden locked up, my sister bride, a spring enclosed, right? A spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. So if this is unopened, right? Because it says at that time, it will be open. And right now it's sealed. So in the Old Testament, it's not possible to receive that water yet. You could only have the promise of this water, but you couldn't have the water to cleanse yourself. You couldn't have the water to drink, or as it says here, to cleanse yourself of sin and impurity. So in other words, without this, then their sins could not be forgiven. And like I said, as a Christian, we believe that it is only through the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus Christ that we can have our sins forgiven. Right? Otherwise, why did God bring his son to suffer and die if all we had to do was bathe in this particular fountain right well actually that's all we really have to do is to bathe in this particular fountain but you just have to know what that fountain is so again this is at the old testament this is a prophecy so for many many years when they read this maybe they were thinking about magical water and we may think that's ridiculous but actually there has been many people throughout history that have searched their entire lives for the fountain of life. You know, Ponce de Leon, it's a very famous one, right? He spent his whole, his whole life looking for the fountain of life, right? The fountain of youth. You also have a, a Chinese king who spent almost his entire fortune searching for the fountain of life because this is the kind of terms that actually come up. But now knowing today how God speaks, how he speaks in this figurative language, how he's hiding the secret until the time comes. So let's go to the time of the first coming, and then we'll see. So once again, it's through the fulfillment that we can begin to understand these things. Okay, so let's go ahead and read this together. John chapter 4, verse 10 and 14. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Good reading. Okay, so once again, we have the prophecies of the Old Testament, and then who comes? Jesus. Jesus, who was the word made flesh. Jesus, who was the one who had the knowledge of God and was proclaiming the very words of God. So what does he say now? I can't get into the full story, but this is when he's talking to a Samaritan woman during the day. And he asks, you know, her for some water. And she's surprised that, you know, he, he's even talking to her. And this is what he says. You know, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, right? And who is it? It's, of course, the Messiah. It's Jesus. You would have asked him and he would have given you what's referred to as living water, right? Living water. And she goes on to say, but what are you talking about? You've got nothing to draw from, right? You've got, you've got nothing in, in your hands. How are you supposed to give me this living water? Because he wasn't talking about literal water. You know, in verses like Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, it says that the lips of the righteous are a fountain of life. And of course, Jesus was the righteous one. The lips of the righteous are a fountain of life. So what flowed from within him? was that water of life. So that's why he says, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Imagine that. You know, I, I don't think the, the bottled water companies of today would really go for that, right? You know, you drink one bottle of water and then you'd never thirst again. Uh, that put them out of business, wouldn't it? But, but we know that that's not the case. Okay, this living water, this spring of living water, once you have it, then you have it with you always. So what would this water be? Well, again, looking into the scriptures is what helps us. In a verse of the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verses 1 and 2, God says, let my teachings fall like rain. Let my words descend like dew. God equates his teachings, the word of life, to the water of life, to water from heaven. And what is it that Jesus had? Jesus had the word of life. And if he taught that word of life to others, then they themselves would have that word of life. And then they themselves can be the one to teach others that word of life. That's why he says, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, right? A spring of water welling up to eternal life. So 
what I'm showing you again, Old Testament, God speaks about a fountain that is sealed. He speaks about a, a garden that's locked up, right? This, this place where you're, you're not allowed to get this water, but I promise he says it's coming, right? On that day, this will be open to you. And at the time that Jesus came, that's when it was fulfilled. Okay, so let's look at another one. Okay, so now this one is about a branch or a root or even like a stump or things like that, okay, which is about plants. There's a lot of prophecies, a lot of scriptures that, prefer, or to, that uh, uh, pertain to plants and animals, these types of things. So the one that we're going to look at, clear that up. All right, let's go ahead and read these together. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, a shoe will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Amen. 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 Okay, so here we have a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And Jesse was actually the, the father of, of David. Right? And David was the, the king that God had promised would always have somebody on the throne. So this is why if you look at Matthew chapter 1 or you know, Luke chapter 3, it talks about the genealogy of, of Jesus. And it takes it back into the time of the kings as well. It says, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Right? The days are coming. Once again, as you see those, that term, right? the days are coming. That's prophecy. When I will raise up. You know, to David, a righteous branch, right? A righteous branch, once again. So what, if you think about what a branch is, right? A branch is something that's a part of the main trunk, right? So it has to be connected to the main trunk. And its job is to produce fruit. If it's not producing fruit, then it's not useful, right? Uh, the leaves are meant to absorb the sunlight and give the like, life to the, to the tree itself. So that's the job of the branches, to be able to produce that fruit. So here we have God speaking about plants and how these plants are meant to, again, bear fruit. So if we jump to the time of the first coming. Okay. So Jesus says here, now this is a, a time when Jesus is actually speaking to his disciples. Right? He's speaking to, to his disciples and he says, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. This is why God spoke about plants, right, and animals. He was the farmer. He's the gardener. He's the one, right, the creator. And so what was Jesus? Jesus wasn't a literal plant, but he's calling himself a tree, right? He's calling himself a grape tree. Uh, there was a time that I was watching a show, and it had to do with, um, like, different vineyards in South Africa. And they were searching for the oldest vine that was that was there at the time and when they finally found it this thing was so big like whenever i think about a, a grape vine i always think of something really small and skinny then you know it needs to be wrapped around other like sticks in order to you know for it to hold itself up but this thing was massive it looked like the like an oak tree the size of it was so big you couldn't put your arms around it two or three people would have to go around to put their arms around it so this is the type of grape tree that we have to think about when we're talking about Jesus, not some skinny little vine, although he was looked like a root out of dry ground, it says in Isaiah. But <laughs> point being is that he was he was a he was a very mighty, you know, mighty tree. And why? Because he had branches that were attached to him. He says, I am the true vine. But actually what he calls his disciples. He says the disciples are also branches. So that's that, that organization that actually God was creating at the time of the first coming, where Jesus himself was that, that stump, that root, okay? the, the main branch, the main trunk, and then out from him, that's where the rest of you know, that truth was able to come, through the disciples, and then their job was also to produce fruit. Jesus's job, what did he do? He, he began to produce the fruit first, right? He chose the 12 disciples. He began to preach the word of truth, and then through them, the rest of the world comes to know this truth. So again, what we're doing is we're looking at the time of the Old Testament and we're just seeing how God spoke. 
how he used this type of language, how he hid the secrets of Jesus through the prophecies. But he did so in a way that people could never have imagined what the actual fulfillment was going to be. And the reason I want you guys to really wonder about this and look into this is because, again, we are not people that are living at the time of the first coming. We have promises and prophecies for the time of the second coming. But by understanding how God works, by understanding how he fulfilled the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament, we can begin to understand how that's possible for the next as well. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking into a little bit now as well. And as I said, for, you know, for today, it's mostly a lot of introduction because we're going to be talking about a lot of these things as we go into the future. You know, hopefully, as I said, we want to spark that interest, that desire to want to know these things because many people have never really looked into the promises of the second coming. They, they think, well, it doesn't really concern me, but actually it does. The people at the time of the first coming, they were waiting for that time too. And they just assumed that they would just believe when God came because they were all believers in God, right? All the disciple or all the, um, the physical Israelites, right? The ones that study the scriptures every day. But then when Jesus came, you know, in John chapter five, verse 39, he says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them, you possess eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify about me. And then he says, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Just like that, that scripture said about Isaiah, you know, that living stone that was rejected by men. And so we don't want to, we don't want to have that same heart, right? That complacent heart that, oh, well, you know, of course I'm going to believe. We have to be diligent. We have to be those people that understand so that we can actually accept it when it comes and realize the truth when it comes. So I'm going to go through this list of just a few ways that Jesus has spoken of coming in the time of the second coming and how he's you know, planning on, on appearing in different ways. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into descriptions of these things or give any explanation. That's for the future, right? That's for the future for you guys. So if you want to you know, jump into that in the future. Okay. So at the time of the second coming, you know, knowing when, where, how, what are these things going to be taking place? So if you look at, you know, in verses like uh, Luke chapter 13, you know, just like Matthew 24 says the same thing. No one knows the day or the hour. So when the disciples asked, when is this going to happen? Right? No one knows. But he does tell you signs, he says. Well, those signs, those signs can be misunderstood if you think about them in the same way as the Old Testament. Like if they were literally waiting for a fountain to be opened, if they were literally waiting for a rock to be put into a certain place, then they would not see the signs. Right? But knowing what the fountain was, knowing what the rock was, when that time comes, then they can believe that the signs are actually taking place. So he says here that Jesus is going to be found on Mount Zion. Right? Revelation chapter 14, that on Mount Zion, you find you know, the lamb, you find God, you find the, the 144,000, many, many different things on Mount Zion. But if he's on Mount Zion, then how can these other things take place? Like There's other ones that say every mountain and island will be removed from its place. Okay, so what is Mount Zion if it's not removed? How is, it not, how is everything else removed? Right? But he also says he'll be like the lightning in the sky. And the lightning is something that is you know, very quick. Right? It's here, it's gone. Right? Also says he's going to come like a thief. And I always thought that was interesting because if it's that he's you know, on Mount Zion, but he's coming like a lightning, but a thief, a thief is something that you don't know is coming. Right? They usually come when everybody else is not paying attention. Right? That's when a thief actually comes. The greatest thief would be someone that they didn't even know the thief ever existed, right? They stole stuff and you never knew it happened, right? But it also says he's coming on the clouds. And if he's coming, if he's on Mount Zion, but he's coming like a thief with the lightning, but then on the clouds, you can't really put all that together, especially if he's coming on a white horse. Now, is the white horse the clouds? You know, sometimes you lay on the hill and you start to make things out of the clouds, you know, like, oh, that looks like a turtle. That looks like a bear, right? Is that the kind of white horse it is? Or, you know, all these things, they're spoken of in many, many different ways. And again, it says he'll be like a thief, right? Unknown at when to, what time it's going to actually come, right? Unknown. This one, it says that he comes before the sun, moon, and stars fall. But then there's another that talks about how he comes after the sun, moon, and stars fall. So again, my point is not to really get into all these things at this time. But just to show you that there's many, many, many different ways that 
that it's spoken of about the second coming, different prophecies that need to come. And all of them have to make sense. All of them have to be true, right? It can't just be one or two of them. Everything has to be fulfilled. And there is a way of understanding that. And that's why we really want to get together you know, throughout the week, what we do is we discuss these things, we talk about them, and we really dive into the, the Old Testament, we really dive into the time of the first coming, and it helps us to truly understand the time of the second coming. So I really hope and encourage that you guys, you know, choose to do that as well. Okay, so how are we meant to understand these things? Well, it's by knowing the figurative language. Right? These things are talked about, a mountain, lightning, clouds, a horse, the sun, the moon, the stars. Again, if God is using a vision, just like the Old Testament, he talks about a fountain, a branch, a rock. But there's also scriptures of the Old Testament where he talks about lightning. He talks about the winds and the clouds. He talks about the sun, moon, and stars. So these are the things we need to begin to understand. So some prophecies uh, and their fulfillment of the Old Testament. So God spoke figuratively about Jesus in many different prophecies, right? Many different ways. But as we know, these things were sealed. They were hidden. How? In that vision, in that figurative language, in parables. But when the physical fulfillment comes, that's when everyone is able to understand. That's when it says to reveal, right? To open and show, to make it known. So when Jesus came, this is how he was actually revealed, right? He's revealed through physical fulfillment. Because Jesus was an actual person. And he did actual events. So we can see, oh, this is actually what Jesus did. This is how it was spoken of, but this is what he really did. And then you put the two together. And then you can understand the prophecy. You can understand what actually took place. So for example, that. Okay, and Malachi. Malachi is the Old Testament. It's the last book of the Old Testament. And it's kind of like the book of Revelation for the Old Testament. It talks about the time of the end. It talks about the day of the Lord. Right? It's leading up to that moment. And Malachi was written about 400 years before Jesus came. So for 400 years, nothing happens. They have these promises and prophecies, and then it's quiet. For us, it's just a flip of a page, right? You go from Malachi to Matthew chapter one, just floop, like that. But for them, it was generations, like four generations, five generations of people came and went before anything took place. Now, in Luke, which is what we're going to look at, this is how this, you know, kind of understanding the prophecy and the fulfillment are tied together, okay? So in the prophecy, and I'll just go ahead and go through this right now, it says, surely the day is coming. Again, what we say about when we, when we see these things, right? This is prophecy. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace, right? Oops, get rid of that. It will burn like a furnace, so the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. Every arrogant and evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is on that day that is coming, again, prophecy, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. So here we see the root and the branch once again. But most importantly, we see that everything is going to be set on fire. I mean, that sounds really destructive, doesn't it? This is a promise that God said. When he comes, everybody's going to be burned by fire. So that, that's very scary. And if you're expecting that to take place, then that's, that's something that you're looking for. But if it doesn't happen in the way that you anticipated, you might have a hard time believing. But doesn't mean that it's not true. See, we know that Jesus is the truth, right? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We know that Jesus had the word of God. He had the knowledge of God. So whatever Jesus says is the truth at that time, that is the truth. And what happens? Jesus is the one that actually came to fulfill this, right? Oops, let's go back to that. So if you look at Luke chapter 12, verse 49, this is Jesus speaking. And he says, I, meaning Jesus, right? I have come to do what? I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it was already kindled. Now, I don't know if you've read the, the Bible much. Um, you know, it's a good thing to just, you know, get to read, you know, as much as you can. But there's nowhere in the Bible that Jesus actually burned anything. Right? He, didn't, he didn't call down fire from heaven. As a matter of fact, when his disciples even asked about doing it, he says, no, 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 no. You don't know what you're talking about. Jesus didn't have fire shooting out of his fingertips, right? He wasn't in arson, burning down synagogues. 
And yet this has also been fulfilled. Jesus was the one that brought that fire. Well, in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14, God says that his word is like fire. And what did Jesus bring? He brought the word of God. What did it do? It judged the people. It purified them. It cleansed them. It, it burned away you know, things that were not of God. Or what did it do? If you were arrogant and you were prideful, then instead of it purifying you, it judged you and destroyed you. So God did bring fire. Jesus did bring fire. It's just not the kind of fire that they thought it would be. Now, keep this in mind for the end as well, okay? The end of the, the seminar that we have. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of that. Okay, so how Jesus was hidden in the Old and New Testament. So knowing that Jesus was something that was a mystery of God, something that he wanted people to eventually come to understand, but it was something that he was hiding also from the enemy. So in Colossians, Colossians chapter two, and this is just a summary, okay, of the, it's not, it's not uh, word by word in this particular thing, just the main point. It says that in Jesus, right, in Jesus was hidden all the mysteries of God. And those mysteries are some of the ones that we looked into, the mystery of the sealed fountain, the mystery of the, the stone that's set in Zion, right? Everything being burned by fire. These are mysteries. How is God going to fulfill these things? But when the reality actually came in 1 John chapter 1, it says that Jesus was that, that word of God, and he was made flesh, and he dwelled among us. So through the life of Jesus, we can come to understand the mysteries that were spoken of. Uh, in the time of the second coming, it'll be the same. There are prophecies written about Jesus in the Old Testament that are also being spoken of in Revelation. And Revelation is about the time of the second coming. Okay, so we're again, we're not going to be talking about these too much, just, just looking into them to see that they're there. And then that's what we're going to be, you know, really discussing a lot deeper in the future as well. Okay. Let me get rid of all of this. Okay, so just really quickly. Oh, sorry, this one was supposed to be changed a while ago. Forgive me. I think I put up the wrong one. This is supposed to be Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. We had changed it. I think I just put up the wrong one. All right. <laughs> so again, just a real quick prophecy about the Old Testament and then how it's written very similar inside of Revelation. So here we have that stone once again, right? See, I lay a stone I have set in front of Joshua, right? There are seven eyes on that stone and I will grave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day, right? in a single day. And we know that that stone represented Jesus, right? He was the stone that was set in Zion. This is what we already saw in first Peter. Well, here in Revelation chapter five, verse six, now we see, I saw the lamb. Once again, we know the lamb is Jesus, right? He was that sacrificial lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and it had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So just showing that the same way that Jesus was spoken of in the Old Testament, it's very similar in the time of Revelation. So what does that mean? Well, if God fulfilled it one way in the time of the first coming, why would he not fulfill it that same spiritual way in the time of the second coming? He talked about the fountain being open, but it was literally the words of Jesus coming out of his mouth. He talked about the fire from heaven, but literally what it was, was Jesus giving judgment and purifying the hearts and the minds of the people. And in the time of the second coming, we have verses that are very, very similar. And there's another one that talks about the root. Okay, here it says, the days are coming, once again, prophecy, right? We talked about this, where he's going to raise up to David a righteous branch. So there's that branch once again. And then when you look at Revelation 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, right? I, Jesus. So he's speaking of himself in the same way. He's using the same language that God used, the same knowledge that God used. So what does this do? It helps us to reveal the second coming. Right? This is what the, the whole topic of today's seminar is about, revealing the time of the second coming, 
helping us to understand, helping us to realize that, that we can understand. If we really take the time to study, to look into the scriptures, to see how God fulfilled his promises and prophecies, right? Okay, we're moving on. We don't have a lot of time left for this, so I'm going to go through. Okay, so once again, this is, uh, this is the end of the, the seminar, and I just want to leave you guys with a, kind of a question, you know, maybe just a wonder, as this is a scripture that has been brought up a lot in different studies that I've done, and uh, people have a lot of fear when it comes to this particular scripture, but, you know, I'm saying that we don't have to, not if we understand it properly. We can actually, as it says, even in the scripture, it actually says that we should be looking forward to this. So again, in Malachi, right? In Malachi, we saw this is the Old Testament, and it was kind of the book of Revelation for the Old Testament, the time of the end that was coming. And when we see what happens, of course, that's the first coming. So it says, that day is coming and will set them on fire. That was Malachi. And then Jesus says, I have come to bring fire on this earth. And he actually wishes it was already being done. So we know this is how Jesus brought that fire. Well, this is a scripture that is talking about the second coming. Right? This particular one's talking about the second coming. It says, but that day, again, but that day of the Lord, this is prophecy. And not prophecy about the Old Testament, right? This is prophecy not about the first coming, about the second coming. That day will come like a thief. There's that thief once again. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So it sounds very, 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 very similar, doesn't it? Very familiar. That everything will be destroyed by fire. And then he says, but we should be looking forward to this day. But that's a very difficult thing to look forward to. If everything, everything that we love, everything that we see, the beauty in this world, there is beauty in this world. There are many, you know, many beautiful things that everything is destroyed. The heavens are destroyed. The whole universe is destroyed. Why? Because we're sinners. Because man is a sinner. And it never really truly made sense that God would destroy the entire universe just because we're sinners. But if you think about what that fire does, it purifies. It cleanses. It gets rid of the old. And it creates something new. So that's what I'd like to leave with you guys today. You know, really, we talk about the time of the second coming. We talk about these promises and prophecies. But what do they mean for us, right? What is it that we have to understand? How should we be believing these things? Should we be believing that the whole world is going to be destroyed? The whole universe is going to be destroyed? Or should we be using the logic of the Old Testament? Should we be using the logic that God has been speaking for thousands of years and using the first coming to help us to truly understand the time of the second coming? So that's what I'd like to leave with you guys today. Okay. I just want to say thank you guys so much for, for joining us. Um, again, this is just a, a small seminar to introduce the ideas of many of the discussions that we have in the future, many of the topics that I really think are so fascinating. They're so wonderful. And of course, God's knowledge is, you know, it's without boundaries, right? I mean, it's so in depth. And so we're just scratching the surface on these things. And I really hope that you guys have that, that passion, right? It just, it, it brings, as it says, that fire, if you will, of that passion inside your heart. So that you have that, um, you know, that ability to take that next step, right? To take that next step and to gather together and to really begin to discuss these things in detail. Okay, so that's why I'm going to stop the PPT. All right. So once again, as I look at all the faces, you know, I just want to say thank you guys so much for this time. I really appreciate the effort that you guys are even making to gather together at this time. I know we're in a very difficult time in the world, and there's a lot of people that are are struggling in many different ways. And this is something that gives me hope. You know, when I'm able to look at the screen and see these people from all over the world, we have multiple countries right now, different time zones, and yet we're all, we're all connected through this one thing, which is through faith. You know, become that brothers and sisters in faith. And I, I really am thankful for that. I just want to say thank you guys because it gives me hope, you know, and I really appreciate that. So I'm going to end with a closing prayer and then I'm going to pass it back on to the presider and we'll have some fun playing some games. All right, let's go ahead and... And with the closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the creator of the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. Father, we are so grateful that you gave us this opportunity to be able to gather together in this fellowship, to look into your words of promises and prophecies, 
to look into the time of the first coming to see how you fulfilled those things through your son, Jesus Christ, and the work that he did. Father, we know that it is through that sacrifice and through that blood, through the very cross that he took upon himself, Father, that we are able to receive forgiveness of our sins. We are truly grateful for this, Father, and we know that this is something that we can never repay. So, Father, please put it into our hearts, into our minds, that in order to truly accept this, what it is that you want us to know is acknowledgement, knowledge and wisdom of you, to be able to truly understand the gospel that has been preached around this world for 2,000 years. To help us, Father, to have these words in our hearts and our minds so we can be a part of those that are within the new covenant. Father, I pray for each person that is here. You know what level that they are at spiritually and with whatever knowledge they have, whatever problems and difficulties they are going through, Father. I pray that you look upon them with mercy, forgiveness, strength, and wisdom, and to provide everything that they need in abundance, Father, to continue this walk of faith. Help us, Father, to stay faithful to you always to stay upon this path and not veer to the right or to the left, but to be those people that can become that light of the world for others. To be, as it says, that, that fragrant offering that is pleasing to you, Father. We know that this is a place of darkness in this world and we're going through very difficult times, but we have that hope that you are always with us, Father. And as we looked into some of the prophecies of the second coming, instead of it bringing fear to us, Father, we ask that it brings hope, it brings understanding, and that we can be a part of it, Father. We long for you to come. We long to be with your son, Jesus Christ, once again. We ask for this time to come quickly. Until we are able to meet again, Father, please continue to send your ministering angels to protect and watch over each person. And for those that were unable to make it today, Father, for whatever reason, please guide and protect them as well. Once again, Father, we thank you so much for this time, so much for the, the opportunity, even through this Zoom, to be able to look into these things, to be able to be those that can gather together in this way. We know that if we gather together in spirit, that your spirit is with us as well. We offer all glory to you, Father. We pray this in your son's most righteous and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.